of Keller Williams, Ed Ed Week. We are so lucky to have Paul Levy on the the call with us today. And for those of you that don't know Paul, um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background about him because he he may not publicly uh, get all the credit that he deserves. So, um, you know, in just reading up about Paul and hearing him speak over the last couple of years at at our office, I learned so much about the impact that he's had on the city that you may not be aware of. So I just want to kind of bullet point a couple of those things. And I know Paul won't toot his own horn about this, so I'll, I'll do it for him. So um, when, when Paul came on the scene back in, I think it was 1989, he, he had one job and that was make Philly a viable place again. So he had a couple main main jobs, make Center City clean, make Center City safe, and then remake the city. Which is, which is what he did. And there's been no Philadelphia more responsible than Paul Levy for transforming downtown Philly into what it's become. So Paul's been responsible for, for some really unbelievable things that you guys get to enjoy every single day. He was responsible or, or, or one of the main drivers of Avenue of the Arts, the Reading Viaduct Park, um, the revitalization of the Ben Franklin Parkway, Dilworth Plaza, which is right at City Hall, uh, Love Park, which just got finished up uh, last year. And, and I think Schuylkill River Park. I'm not sure uh, if that was, no, not, not Schuylkill River no, Park. No, I'm going to give you that credit anyway. But Yeah, and I don't get Love Park either, either, but thank you. And, and, and Sister Cities Park, I believe as well, yes, plus a bunch it. of other things. And all those blue and turquoise jackets that you see all around the city, cleaning up the city um, and keeping the city clean, Paul's in charge of that. So he is, Paul's the CEO uh, and, and I believe the founder of the Center City District and just a, an awesome guy, a great speaker. And he's got a great presentation for you guys today. So sit back, relax, and I'll turn it over to you, Paul. No, thank you. Let me just make sure I'm sharing my screen. We're all set up, ready to go. Let's see if this works. Everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me and, and welcome on this gloomy day. It's a good day to be inside still. Um, and... What I want to do is really talk about three broad things that, that we're really dealing with. Hang on, I'm having just a little trouble moving my screen. There we go. Okay. You know, one, I want to just talk about the economic housing and development trends that we are experiencing as we're coming out of or still deep in the middle of this uh, pandemic. I want to talk specifically about our role in recovery, what we've been doing really since March, parks, public spaces. And I want to offer some prognosis for recovery. And I'll simply put it this way at the beginning. If you ask me to look ahead six to 12 months, I'm very optimistic about Center City. I think we're going to have some real challenges over the next three to four months. That doesn't dim my optimism in any way, but I think we need to be candid about a set of challenges that may be in front of us in some sectors, but not all sectors. But when, you know, when we started before this pandemic going into the, uh, sorry, going into this situation, I just need to clear a couple things off of the top here. Why is it? Okay. Um, you know, we had about, sorry about that. We had almost 322,000 jobs concentrated in Center City. And just to put that in perspective, you know, Philadelphia has a highly concentrated area of employment with Center City being 42% of all jobs, University City being 10%. So you've got 8% of the city's land area with 53% of all jobs. From a housing point of view, that explains so much about where the market is active. 80% of the housing in centers in Philadelphia is being built around these two major nodes. And that's been the trend for the last four to five years because both Center City and University City have been the fastest growing employment centers within the city. In February, we were entering our 11th straight month of job growth or 11th straight year of job growth coming out of the last recession with almost 85,000 jobs. And up through February, we were really in a strong position. And then obviously the pandemic and the stay at home order had a really devastating impact on what was happening within the city. You can see we lost almost 76,000 jobs erasing almost all the gains we had back to 2016. 
It's been very specific though by industry. The most heavy hit and hardest hit has been leisure and hospitality, restaurants, arts and culture and restaurants. Uh, uh, and and uh, you can see almost 37% job loss. If you look at what I've highlighted in blue, largely office sector and healthcare has been hurt, but nowhere near as devastating as the hourly workers who are in hospitality, in hotels, et cetera. Educational services looks down, but some of that is seasonal. So there are some sectors that have been hit very seriously and others have not been hit. Now we're in a process of gradual recovery and you can see the dark blue lines are 2020 and, and teal is 2019. We're gradually adding jobs back within the city, but you can see we're still significantly 7.9% below the employment levels that we had back in February. Our unemployment rate prior to this was 6% in the city. It spiked all the way up to 18%. It's come back down to about 11, 12%. But as you'll note, the sit, the state and the nation are doing somewhat better than we are in that regard. The good news is that both new and ongoing claims for unemployment have been steadily trending downward after that initial peak. Now, all the data I'm going to be citing today, you can find on our website, in particular this report on the left, but we invest a great deal in research and put it out in a number of forms. So you can find almost everything I've presented here today on our website. When you look at the commercial office sector, on paper, things are looking very good. Rent collections have held up very well. That's good for the Center City District because that's a primary source of our revenue. Vacancies creeped up a little bit, but the reality is that if you actually ask how many people are at their desks in office buildings downtown, it is no more than five to 10%. That has huge implications. Uh, when we ask people what will bring you back to the office, no surprise here, 92% say the availability and wide distribution of a vaccine. You know, based on the good news we got this week, most people think that it will be possible to start distributing in February or March, but we're really spring 2021, I think, before we get a widely available vaccine. No surprise when we asked people when they thought they'd be back in work, you can see it is spring and summer of 2021 that most people have been projecting. This is in the office sector, as well as the administrative and professional sides of healthcare and education. You know, what people want, well, yes, there's going to be an increase in remote work, but fundamentally collaboration, face-to-face -face mentoring of younger staff, that's the pull back into the office. And so I think, as I said, I look ahead nine months, I'm optimistic about that return to work. It's just until we have that vaccine in place. There was a significant drop you can see in SEPTA ridership, look at March and April, and a very slow recovery that actually tapered off a bit in September. You know, can learn a lot about the city by this chart, which is telling you that bus ridership is back up to 45% of January levels, but regional rail is at 18%. Effectively, those people who are hourly workers relying on buses coming into the city versus many people who are able in the outer neighborhoods and in the suburbs to work remotely. It's a really bifurcated experience we're having right now. Parking off street has seen a steady rebound, but there are only, this is Parkway's numbers in Center City, only at about 54% of same time last year. Bike share has been doing very, very well. People are getting around, less cars on the street, and there's a great increase in the number of bikes downtown. Here's the most devastated industry, obviously, which is hotel occupancy, which plummeted to almost zero, and best projection for next spring is up around 40%. 275 conventions canceled, 243 tentatives canceled. So really significant. And of course, international travel's been suspended. That's been a huge impact on the hotel industry. Revenues, you can see, went to the floor. And in September, they were back up to 30% of September 19 levels. 
Now we've got 20 to separate pedestrian counting cameras on the streets across Center City at the locations you can see here. And they tell a very interesting and similar story. You're looking at the left at March in which pedestrian volumes just plummeted and then all through the summer gradually rising. But then right around Labor Day, we began to pick up. So we're back up in October to 50 to 60% of 2019 levels. One. What, what's fascinating here is that if you look, for example, at 16th and Chestnut Street, it's at 54% of the volumes of same time last year. 1700 Walnut Street is at 60% of volumes, but move over to the office district, 1700 block of JFK is at 23% of volume. So you can see that real differentiation between the office district and the rest of the downtown. This has obviously had huge implications for ground floor businesses, a September survey. As people came back, we think there's a, there are 75% of restaurants are open, 84% of retail is open, but they've been challenged by the diminishment of pedestrian traffic. A quick look at sort of broad citywide housing trends. What's fascinating here is that citywide has done better than the downtown, but in general, you can see dark blue again is, is 2020, that the volume of transactions has been exceeding 2020, 2019. In center city, you can see it was more severely hit in terms of a downturn, but September transactions exceeded September of the year before. So there's a recovery going on here and most significantly citywide, the sale transaction average has actually outperformed 2019. So there's generally good news in terms of what's been happening in the housing market from a numerical point of view, really interested in hearing your perspective, but in general, the recovery has held up. What's been clear, and I think you know this in the, the transactions you're doing, this is a map of where new development occurred in 2019, early 2020. And what we used to call Greater Center City from Girard to Tasker River to River, those boundaries were really burst through in the last several years and a tremendous amount of activity, obviously north of Girard Avenue has really kept the market going. You can find a lot of this data in our April 2020 housing report. This is a report we were just about to release uh, in March, and we actually had to sadly go back and turn every present tense sentence into past tense, but we have all the data as to where the market was in March. But as I think what I'm seeing, and I'm really curious your reaction is, I think that the neighborhoods north of the core and south of the core are actually doing better than the core of the downtown. I think the significantly improved amenities that you see along Passyunk Avenue or along Fairmount Avenue or in Point Breeze or Frankfurt Avenue up in, in uh, Fishtown, these neighborhoods need center city less than they would have 15 or 20 years ago from basic services. The other really huge trend is in the 80s, you could have really counted on one hand the number of supermarkets in center city there are 30 now with more on the way. And this has really been the essential lifeline, I think, for neighborhood stability across the entire city as a whole. By contrast, I've seen some of the biggest challenges in the core of the downtown where through the summer, you had basically 80% of the daily population missing. So you had people living here without a lot of other people around them. Cultural institutions performing arts were closed. Now we saw starting in September, a lot of the cultural institutions opening, but performing arts theater is not coming back till 2021. That remains a challenge for us. Now the volume of development, again, dark blue is 2020. You can see, excuse me, transfer tax collection. You can see it cl clearly plummeting, but by the summer and going into September, starting to come back. Most interestingly, building permits of all kinds citywide plummeted again, you can see in April, but we're up to 82% in September of the volume of building permits that we had a year ago. So not full recovery, but moving in the right direction. 
If you look in the core of downtown today, both the Laurel and Art House have decided to proceed forward. Toll Brothers put their 7th and Samson project on hold, but they're moving forward with the Broad and Noble project right at the rail park. So you're continuing to see a lot of significant development. Parkway has moved forward with the new headquarters for Morgan Lewis at the 2200 block of Market Street. PMC is moving forward. This picture is way out of date. The towers are really rising up and they're continuing to add new uh, residential along the Schuylkill. And I think quite simply, the largest financially strongest developers have been able to move forward. Those who are you know, well aligned with cash. I think the interesting challenges that I see in the core of the downtown regarding housing demand uh, and then sort of spreading out, which is if you look at vine to pine, uh, you know, if you look here, 45% of the residents are aged 20 to 34, 27% are 55 and older. Uh, but then you start to look at the older groups and you've got, you know, a significant portion of the population 35 to 54. And I think each of these age groups has been impacted and has been affected somewhat differently. One of the concerns that I have is around quality of life issues. This was pre-pandemic. Uh, the overwhelming majority of people's feeling safe, uh, but clearly a certain percentage saying they felt unsafe. The number one issue back in the fall was aggressive panhandlers homeless people on the street, absence of police, but we've consistently asked the question uh, of things that make you feel unsafe. We have this list and then we have the choice. These things are part of urban life and do not bother me. And you'll see that 24% answered that way. But where I find it fascinating is this is breaking it down by age. Now we had a response group of over 5,000. Now this was pre-summer, this was pre pre some of the police shootings, again, pre looting and vandalism, but look at uh, the scoring around absence of police. Those who are under 34, only 28% are looking for more police. Those 35 to 54, it's 38%. Those 55 and older, 44%. The flip side of that, homelessness, panhandling and other behavioral issues 35% of 20 to 34 year olds say, these are part of urban life and do not bother me. And you can see as people go up in age, those factors matter more. So again, who you are, your age, I think is really impacting your perceptions now. What I think is most important from a housing point of view is we have all in your industry in particular has benefited from this huge growth in 20 to 34 year olds that we have in the city. But look at that teal box, which is those who are 20 to 24 year olds. What's fascinating here is that number has been steadily going downward. And that's not some failing of Philadelphia, that's national demographic trends. There are just less people entering college uh, that's been a challenge for colleges, which is why they've gone for so many more international students. But that group of people is a declining number. So clearly the return to classes is going to be key for the vitality of the city, but equally important, if not more, is going to be the, the ability to retain a greater share of college grads. Now, I had thought four or five months ago that there were no students in Philadelphia. And the more we talked to universities, I guess lectured in a few schools in Penn, Drexel have 70 to 90% of their students in the city attending classes remotely. And so we've got a much larger student population here than we thought we might've had when the pandemic started as several brokers have said, what 20 year old wants to go back and sleep on their mother's couch at this point. So clearly a lot of people are staying here, which I think is good for retail vitality and restaurant vitality. But even in good times as a priority for the city, we're gonna to have to do a much better job of retaining people in their thirties and forties. Clearly schools are incredibly important, but it's important to note that 70% of the kids who live in greater center city 
from Girard to Tasker are, are attending public schools. So that process, even though everybody's remote at this point, of public schools responding along with the independent and charter schools has been a really positive issue for retention. But we need to continue to focus and do more, I think, around quality of life challenges. Anybody who's aware of the ATV vehicles that are rushing around, graffiti's gone up, and I'll talk a bit about homelessness in a moment. But I think we've also got a really important role here to stress the positives, which I want to talk about, which have been really significant. I think we're going to have to do more than rebound economically as a city. We did a really good job of generating new jobs in the last decade that paid 35000 or less. We did not perform as well as other cities in those mid-wage jobs, that thirty-five to 100000 So we can't just rebound from this pandemic. We have to do better than we were doing before it. Clearly, a much greater emphasis on growing black and brown owned businesses and businesses of all kinds are going to be, have to be a major priority for us as a city. I think we're going to need a stronger co coalition for growth in this city and not, as is proposed now, a new construction tax on all construction within the city. We can talk about that within Q&A. But let me shift now and just take you through what the CCD has been doing and then leave lots of time for, for Q&A. You know, we are an organization that is funded by a surcharge on about 1600 properties within the core of the downtown. That is the boundaries that you see in yellow. We have a formal plan and budget that describes all services that we submit to property owners. They need to go through an approval process Council approves it, but we operate independently from the city. We've got a five-year plan and budget, and we've been operating with about a $27 million budget, growing from 6.5 when we first started. Got a very, very broad-based board of office developers, retail, brokers, residential, uh, commercial, healthcare employees on our board as a whole. The good news for us is that this time last year, we collected 97% of our assessment revenue. This year, we collected 93%. So it's been very, very solid. It's enabled us to continue to operate. We are able to make modest adjustments to our budget back in March and April. On March 17th, we confirmed that all of our staff were considered essential personnel. And so we've kept everyone out on the street working nonstop. Our core mission has always been the public environment, a clean and safe environment, serving as a friendly, reassuring presence to people downtown. Now we have a total of 148 on-street staff. They work three shifts, seven days a week. They come from all neighborhoods in the city. Every one of them has continued to work. And most importantly, We've been able to be upping what we're doing because our budget has been stable. So we've been out there pressure washing sidewalks with sanit sanitizers, huge explosion of graffiti. We've been out there removing graffiti everywhere. We've stepped up graffiti removal efforts from facades. We continue to all our public safety patrols. And one of the most interesting challenges we faced in April, May, and June is none of the street vendors were there. None of the retail vendors were there. So we literally paid for and bought lunch for all our employees for four months in order to keep them working on the street. And we are obviously now back in an environment where many other people are open. We have fee-for-service cleaning arrangements with almost all the neighborhoods that surround the downtown. Those have continued throughout. And then with the increase in graffiti, we've contracted with a small business that hires only formerly homeless individuals, returning citizens, and we're removing graffiti from parking authority, kiosks, light poles, just continuing to focus on quality of the public environment. When graffiti appeared all over boarded up storefronts, we painted over a whole lot of locations. We partnered with mural arts to enter into agreements with artists to decorate them, to create essentially an outdoor art gallery. Uh, when all the banners from conventions and meetings were not going up, we contracted with another six artists to do banners throughout the downtown, 
all just to add a sense of vibrancy and life to Center City. We used a lot of those designs that unfortunately are still in place on some of the boarded up premises. Our homeless outreach effort, which has been going for two years, restarted in June. This is a really unique partnership in which police, Project Home, and our staff work together to engage people on the street. Last year, we persuaded 191 people to come off the street. No citations, no arrests, connecting people to services. We're up over 90 people helping them come off the street and get the help they need. In June, after the vandalism, we actually added nighttime patrols with vans in the district. And November 1st, without much publicity, we've added a whole new bike patrol of eight bike patrol officers, primarily concentrated right now in the retail and restaurant district, just to add a sense of safety. Again, these people are unarmed, but just to create a sense of a visible presence on the street. We continued with tree planting. We're almost finished planting trees on almost every block within the downtown. And we've got a nonprofit foundation which we solicit support for these type of projects. I think the best part of vitality in this crisis has been the responsiveness of restaurants. And we've worked incredibly closely with them in the city. Just to put some numbers on this, 13% of all jobs in Center City were in food services and retail. Citywide, that was 100,000 jobs. And that sector alone lost 39% of its jobs in April. We work with the city who's been very responsive on this and retailers to develop detailed plans for a whole set of blocks that were closing to make sure we had social distancing. And so 18th Street from all the way actually from Locust up to Sanson has been successfully closed. The 1500 block of Sanson Street, 13th Street uh, in Midtown Village and Art Street next to the Reading Terminal Market. Our website and social media have been promoting businesses, promoting over 500 businesses that have been open to keep them going to really support takeout. We did a very successful restaurant week uh, just with a major focus on takeout to keep those restaurants going. And here's the good news, which is between July and late September, we saw a steady increase in businesses open, going from only 54% up to 79% were open. Outdoor seating went from 2,900 in June up to 5,100 5, in just the district and across all of Center City, Old City, South Street, 9,500 outdoor seating locations. It's been one of the great joys of this kind of crisis period of time. Boarded up premises went in June from 276 down to 56. And then we had the shooting of Walter Wallace and then fears of election unrest. Literally, we spiked back up on November 3rd to 116 boarded up premises. Our count yesterday, we were back down to 60. So not completely down, but moving in the right direction. We brought on new staff to work with brokers and property owners because we're going to need to help rebuild the retail mix of the downtown as we emerge from this. Let me just close by focusing on two of our parks because we have seen that the animation of parks is key to building confidence in the downtown. We have four of them that we actively manage at this point. Sister Cities Park, which is deliberately aimed at children on the uh, Logan Square in front of the cathedral. We turned the fountain back on in June after conversations with lots of parents and pediatricians. We reopened the cafe in July. And then we had put on hold an improvement project in our children's play area to the north. That started up again. We were able to add in all these new attractions for kids. We built this whole new play net at the top. And then the Discovery Garden itself, which is this three inch pond for young kids to play in, reopened in July, but clearly very conscious. This is a picture from last year. We want to limit the volume. So we liberally, deliberately set a 60 person limit and scanning people as they came in just to produce a safe environment. 
We still have the, the streams that kids play in. We added a new dammed up element so kids can dam up the streams, created these hiding nests for young children, push button water jets, and then this climbing net at the top, which has just been great for kids to play in and are still out there now. We've continued to program events for families with kids, soccer shots. Uh, we do concerts for young children, hired an artist to wrap the trees. Uh, we did a, hollow, a Halloween event in the park and have continued to partner with cultural institutions. So families with young children have things to do while their schools are closed, reading programs from the library. And then most recently, we just did this when we emptied the pond, we usually put these rubber play blocks there. Our staff came up with this giant tree that fell over in East Falls that we found up in the Fairmont Park Yard. And what we did is had this work done by a carpenter who we moved it into the park and it has now become a play area for young kids to enjoy something sort of unique within the park. It's been a really big hit. Dilworth, and I'll end here, this has been for us our prized park. In 2019, we had 10.6 million come, people come through a park that had almost no one in it prior to our renovation in 2013. During the vandalism and looting, we had $3.1 million of damage done in that park. So it was really devastated. We were very able, we were able to quickly put it back together we reopened first without the fountains. We reopened the cafe, was able to get glass, have all sorts of social distancing and mask requirements. Uh, we moved chairs and tables out into spaces that were further apart, initially at very high levels of cleaning, reopened the Airstream cafe, all sorts of markers for social distancing, mask requirements and then turned the fountains on with very low water jets in July, just at the time that spray parks were allowed to open, slowly turned them up. The park is filled with health regulations and we've been attracting a modest number of kids, but people of all ages into the park. When it was hotter than hell in July, our team put together these ice sculptures, but the goal was to restore this as a central civic space for the city. We restarted our lunchtime concert series, but with social distancing, deliberately low key. Uh, we did our exercise classes first remotely and then in the park. And then to help restaurants with takeout, we, we sponsored this dinner at Dilworth, or which we installed a lot more market lighting and provided music. We did a great event with the opera company, which really attracted a very, very diverse group of people turned on the artwork just to draw people into the park, just to create a place to be outside, which everybody sees as safer than being inside. We did a very successful harvest weekend, a hay maze, great attractions for families with kids, pumpkin painting, pumpkin carving, po posing for pictures. We did vendors all socially distanced in the park, stilt walkers, and just enjoyed basically seeing people come out with a mask compliance rate of 90%. And anybody who didn't have a mask, we were distributing them and continue to distribute them for free. We are working right now on a modified winter programming uh, installation that has been approved by the health department. The ice skating rink, it opened in 75 degree weather last weekend. Obviously we didn't skate today, but this is now socially distanced with time skating to reduce the size of crowds. But these are shots from this week. Uh, the cabin, the big tent area has open sides for safety reasons, as well as lots of signage posted. The winter garden is back in place where we have a great place to sit in the daytime, topiary animals, it's illuminated at night. And it's just become a great place for people to gather. We've got a wine garden there. It's open in the evenings and we will bring, bring, bring back the tents with the markets, but much more further apart than you see in this picture from last year. We are working on having the light without the show. That is, it's not gonna be every half hour. It will be continuous so it doesn't draw crowds, but you're trying to keep that tradition alive. 
So overall, just to kind of summarize, and then I'll wrap up here. If you just look at this last month, I think you can see the positive trends. Employment up very modestly, 1% between August and September. Unemployment claims down substantially. Construction permits up. Homes sold up. Homes sold in greater city, center city up even more. Real estate transfer revenue up. Sales revenue down in sales tax and SEPTA ridership down. So it's not an unqualified success at this point. I put it this way very simply, we're on a very good course of recovery, but the winter and obviously this new spike we're all reading about and hearing about is a significant challenge. But I think we're on a path of recovery. As I said, I'm optimistic looking six months out. I think we're gonna have a challenging couple of months, but many parts of the economy are humming away. Lots of people are working remotely. They have incomes, they're buying houses, they're renting apartments. So very challenging times, but times that we will recover from. So let me stop there and open it to questions. Thanks, Paul. That was an awesome presentation. And you know, on behalf of all of us, I wanted to thank you for all that you do for the city of Philadelphia. I mean, I, every time I hear you talk, there's just so much stuff that I don't think we, we all realize uh, what the Center City District does for us. So it's really awesome what you guys are doing. So we, ha we have a lot of questions. A bunch of tech, uh, questions got text messaged to me uh, during the presentation. So I'll, I'll sort of moderate those questions and, Absolutely. and then we can go, go from there. So um, obviously with, with all the restaurants being closed and the convention shutting down and the hotels and all of, you know, all the, the businesses that have been closed, and all of the, the, the tax dollars that did not come in from that and all the people that didn't come in spending money, how, how is Philadelphia's economy going to recover from such a deficit? I just have to say, Marlissa, I'm freaking out with the pic. Is that the picture of you behind you with a mask on in front of you? It's a, <laughs> a little unnerving, okay. Um, so I think, first of all, let's differentiate. There are tons of businesses opening with people working remotely. That's the office sector, that's the educational sector, et cetera. All those people are receiving paychecks and those who live in and around Center City or in Philadelphia are spending money. There are then clearly the most hard hit industries, the hotels have, have really had the worst experience and people who work for airlines, obviously. Restaurants obviously was a huge challenge, but as I said, we're back up to 79% who are open. I think they all were making do with outdoor seating. I think clearly takeout and take home has been a key part. Lots of people are improvising now around the, uh, you know, how can you have heated tents outside? So. The shutdown has been one where there's been a lot of improvisation and people working. Now, from a city point of view, the city has been, in my judgment, for way too long, excessively dependent on wage tax and sales tax. And those are highly vulnerable revenues. And where the city, I mean, the city had a significant drop in revenue, which is why they've trimmed back many of their services. The sleeping giant out there is that all of those suburban residents who work in the city, but who have been working remotely are entitled to a rebate from their wage tax in this year. That's gonna be a huge challenge for the city going forward. I should say that Boston as a city that's much more reliant on the real estate tax has had a downturn but nowhere near as negative effect on, on city government. So I think from a downtown economy point of view, again, the office buildings, the tenants are paying rent, even if there's only five to 10% of people in there, but that missing 150,000 workers or the 30,000 hotel rooms are really the missing piece for restaurants and retail. I'm not sure that completely answers your question, I think the core of downtown has had more challenges because it's been the, dem the site for demonstrations, a certain amount of vandalism, et cetera. But I think there's a sigh of relief coming out of this election if uh, we actually come out of the election. I think there's a, a sense in the city that we're turning a corner at this point. Uh, but please ask me more if I didn't 
fully yeah, no, answer your question. I, I appreciate the answer. I, I think you know now with with everybody at home and and, and your slides at five to ten percent of uh, people are actually going to their offices or going. You know, a lot of businesses are still closed, and I think we all kind of have the same feeling that. Um, when all this is over and businesses open back up, the, there will be a lot of businesses that, that don't open back up, that have already shut their doors and, and maybe are just hanging on by a thread that won't open back up. And, you know, I think there will be another wave of economic impact from, from that as well, from a lot of vacancies and storefronts and restaurants not opening and just like, you know, a ton of offices uh, not being utilized. And there'll be a lot of vacancies in the retail and office sectors and commercial sectors as well. So... Yeah, I, mean, I think the basic way to see this is while this has been a devastating and unprecedented event, what it has done is accelerate certain trends. It hasn't completely altered trends. And so in the retail and restaurant sector, just as a rising tide lifts all ships, a receding tide exposes those people who were not as strong beforehand. So I think those businesses, retail restaurants who've been able to improvise, who've got the resources, uh, will be able to adapt. Those who are struggling already, this is gonna be really hard. We're gonna lose restaurants, we're gonna lose some of our favorite retail stores. That's just a sad reality. I think there can be things that done to help keep people alive. But you know, I always like to say, the. I have found two advantages of having white hair. One is I ride SEPTA for free, but the other is I have a long-term perspective. I lived in the city in the 70s and 80s when we lost a quarter of a million jobs and people thought the world was coming to an end. I lived in this city in 1990. In that recession, when the district started, we lost 26% of the value of the downtown and we came back. I, most of you were alive for 9-11 when we thought nobody would ever work in an office building. Again, we're very resilient as a, as a city. I think cities are very resilient. I in no mean, means, mean to minimize the short-term crises, but I would urge people not to take the short-term, very serious problems necessarily as the long-term prescription. We will rebound. We have insanely short memories, right? In two or three years, we will have forgotten a lot of this. I don't mean to minimize the risk of future pandemics, but we adapt. We're very social animals. We want to be together. The hardest thing to do is to recognize and respond to the short-term pain, but not assume that's the full script for the next five years. Yep. Some of the most successful people that I've interviewed and heard speak and, and run the most successful businesses all share one common theme. And that's that they have a long-term perspective right. on, on their views of things. And I think that's right. an important point in case anybody missed that. Um, next question is one, I think one of the, one of the coolest things that I've seen come out of, you know, everything we're going through is the revitalization of outdoor seating. Right. And with a lot of the restaurants being shut down, you know, I do a lot of traveling. Uh, I've done a lot of traveling in my life. And when you go to other cities in Europe and around the country, um, outdoor seating is what, what makes those cities so cool. And, you know, Philadelphia never really had that up until now. And I think it's really an amazing thing that Philadelphia, you know, most restaurants have outdoor seating that, you know, provides a lot of really vibrant uh, vibrancy to these neighborhoods. And is there a plan to, even after the pandemic is over, to keep those outdoor seating arrangements in place? Yeah, no, let me just correct something you said. We've been very good with outdoor seating on very narrow sidewalks. Yes. This is the first time we've really said, let's start closing streets. That's the big difference, I think. Yes. And I think that's been exciting. And while I'm, I'll, I'll be very critical of the city when I think they deserve criticism in the case of outdoor and street closings, They've been amazingly responsive and, and flexible. Now, it helps to have less car traffic to be able to say we're going to close these streets, but watching Old City and Passyunk Avenue and then Center City and a lot of other neighborhoods figure out how to create first Friday and Saturday night. Oh, let's do Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Let's do Thursday. I mean, I live right around Second Street has been closing on Wednesday night in, in Newmarket. So, yes, I think... That's been a really exciting thing to see. We've been blessed with a really warm fall going into winter. Um, 
And it's really kept the city alive and vibrant. And I think there's a lot of conversations now about things that would have been unthinkable, right? Oh, you can't close that street. And the thing is, we're not talking about closing streets permanently. We're talking about closing them on weekends and evenings. So let's just take 13th Street. You would, I, I was the Marriott Hotel when I was open. I wouldn't want 13th Street closed all the time because that's how my passengers are going to arrive. But to close that street from five o'clock on Thursday and Friday and Saturday night or on Saturdays and Sundays. So I think there's going to be more flexibility. I think we've seen it work. The world didn't come to an end. I'm a bike rider. You can ride so many more places now than you could before. And I think that's going to be one of the positives that comes out of this terrible situation. Yeah, I agree. And I hope that it continues many, many years into the future. Yeah. Um, okay, there are some questions in the chat box, one of them being about the, the tax abatement. You know, with the tax abatement ending uh, at the, or su supposedly ending at the end of this year, um, and, and the new proposed construction tax, the 1% construction tax being uh, proposed now at a time where, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, developers have stopped developing stuff because of everything going on. Where do you think uh, the, the, the tax abatement and the construction tax are going to lead us into the future? Sure. And I'll, right after this, I'll send you, you can share. I wrote a long memorandum to every member of council and to the mayor basically saying the construction tax makes no sense. If you want to do what you're doing, bond off of the expiring tax abatements. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Look, I think we have a kind of perception and political problem here. Uh, everybody, and I love to say this to developers and to uh, commercial brokers of condos, please stop talking about the million dollar condos. They are great for you in terms of commissions. They're great as a, but they build resentment and they build concerns about disparities in the city. The reality between 2018 and the end of 2019, 1% of all sales transactions in this city were over a million dollars, okay? 78% of all houses sold, sold for under $275,000. This is an affordable city. The condos that kind of get a lot of people's attention are great for the city, but they're a blip. I think part of the problem is there's this sort of a resentment against wealth coming into the city, which I think is misplaced. I think too, obviously there's been a crisis in the school district and I understand why people don't wanna give up revenue to the schools. I think a very credible argument could be made that most of this development would never have occurred without the 10 year tax abatement. That said, I think council, the votes were there and the mayor agreed not to an end to the 10 year tax abatement, but a dialing down in the last three to four years, 10987. Now, uh, Councilman Heenan introduced a bill to delay that for a year or two. Then uh, President Clark and Sherelle Parker came in with this 1% construction tax idea. Now, I will tell you that Philadelphia has 17 taxes. That would make number 18. Boston has seven taxes. Atlanta has eight taxes. So we're adding to that list of business unfriendly in that regard. The, the analysis we put together simply said a construction tax won't achieve what you want. Notice I said we were at 82% of construction permits, not at full level. If you look at architectural indicators, the rate of new contracts is actually going down in 2021. You can't bond off of an unstable, uncertain construction tax if you're going into this environment. However, the 10 year tax abatement has abatements that have been expiring from development that occurred 10 years ago. That's a reliable source to bond off of and the recommendation we've made to council. If you wanna do that, if you wanna finance the substantial need for affordable housing, which we need to do, bond off of the expiring abatement and leave the abatement in place. Two, I think the politics of that message are really powerful. The 1% construction tax sets up this tax the rich versus help the poor. It's exactly the divisive climate we're in. Keeping the 10 year tax abatement and pledging those returning abatements 
to affordable housing is a great message. It says we want to encourage development, but we want to pledge those revenues to help affordable housing. That's the message we need to have in the city going forward. So I'll be glad to send you the, the long memo I wrote, which is apparently being discussed. Please feel share the, to, to share it. I just think there's short term, let's do this because it feels good, which makes no economic sense. I agree. And I think we all have our fingers crossed that uh, the extension for the tax abatement comes through at the last second. So I yeah, I think it will. I mean, it was going to be pushed at least a year or two. And then this idea of a 1% construction tax was a way to exact a price for getting that. And I think it, I hope this will work out. I can't say it will though. Yeah. Okay. There was another question about uh, offices. So, you know, with everybody working so remotely now and, and a lot of people realizing, like you said, that, that the world uh, will still go on with different things happening. We're all working from home. We're all surviving. You know, a lot of industries are surviving being able to work from home and not having a need to go into the office. So, you know, I know a lot of office buildings got converted into condo buildings and other things over the years. What do you think is going to happen moving forward now that a lot of people maybe don't need their offices anymore? How will that affect Center City? Yeah, again, let's talk short term versus long term. The ability to be on Zoom, WebEx, Teams, BlueJeans. I got so many apps on my computer now. That's all they do is open when I open my computer. This has been remarkable. Think about five years ago. You couldn't have had this meeting, right? I mean, this is great technology. It has really enabled us to adapt. But anybody who has worked collaboratively, you sit in a meeting and you can read the body language of someone, somebody who actually may have something important to say, but they don't want to speak up. Being in person with people, the collaboration, the generating of ideas, I think is incredibly important. I think that will come back. So I think this is a great interim strategy, which we're all really benefiting from. But I think the negatives, if you're a 27 year old, new law associate, or if you're in a real estate firm, you benefit from the mentoring, the experience of from people. You can't walk into anybody's office today, right? Setting up a Zoom or WebEx or BlueJeans meeting is a step other than running into somebody at the coffee stand, right? So I think the mentoring, the growth of younger employees is really suffering. Innovation, collaboration is suffering. So I think right now, fully understand until there's a vaccine, a huge number of people won't get near their offices. No doubt about that. But come May, June, July, it will be gradual. But here's the way I look at it, which is when we first started outdoor seating in the summer, all you saw was 20 and 30 year olds there. And then within a week or two, people say, oh, that's interesting. You saw 45 and 50 year olds. And then there are folks with hair my color sitting out there, right? There was a level of comfort that came from seeing it. And I think as people start to come back, there are some law firms that say you're not allowed to be in the office or only one person per floor. And any firm that's hugely liability conscious, you could understand that. There are real estate firms who have 80% of their people back in their office. We're working with the rotating, no more than 30% of people in our office on any day, but we're rotating people through because of the advantages of collaboration. So I think there will be a greater tolerance use of remote work, no doubt about that, but that was happening already. I mean, this guy, right? We were working from everywhere way before Zooms and team, right? Team, so that will accelerate it but it won't put an end to the office space. On the positive side, how many people want to work in co-working space that six other people sat in that desk in the last three days, right? What that means and what you're seeing in office space is actually the compression is going the other way. People who are designing offices now are actually consuming more space for employees. So that's a pushback the other way. So a, a short answer is right now, most people in offices are working remotely. Remote work will continue, but I do not think it will dominate. I think it will be an important new piece of it, maybe 15 to 20%, but I doubt it will cross 50 or 60% in the next several years once we get past this pandemic. 
Yeah, I think there have been a ton of efficiencies created through all this, but you you lose that personal human to human to human interaction and you lose the culture of the office. I mean, exactly. I get a lot more work done at my house, but it's, it's pretty boring sitting in a room by myself staring at a screen all day. Well, the other thing is I walk to the refrigerator way too much when I walk <laughs> at home, right? How much I've been eating? Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. All right. Next question is from Min. Um how do you incorporate international and multicultural programming or features so we can create a more enhanced globalized environment? Yeah, that's a great question. I think obviously, I mean, it's starting in, it started in the hospitality and tourism industry, which has been really specifically reaching out just to, to reach out. And we've had a huge growth in Asian travel here to the city beyond the normal England and Germany or, 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 or Canadians coming here. I think, you know, there are clearly, business is clearly international. The city, this administration, less than others, have been really trying to build international business relationships. I think it, it's driven by business and, and hospitality. I think we're, you know, we can be at times a parochial and insular city. And the more different people you see in the city, the more you, 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 you gain that uh, kind of familiarity. I'm not sure that's completely answering the question. But I think we've been moving in that direction more so than we were uh, 10 years ago. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And, you know, it felt so good this past weekend. There was life in the city again and everybody was happy and you just felt the energy come back in Philadelphia last weekend. It just it gave us a little glimpse of hopefully what we I, I mean, it was just I, I described last Saturday as like a, a World Series parade without the drunks. Right. I mean, people were out there celebrating and just just to, because it's one of our indicators, you know, on a good day in the spring or summer, we'll have twenty five thousand people in Dilworth Park over 24 hours. We had thirty nine thousand people come through the park last Saturday. Now, there were people out you know, marching, et cetera. But to see the city come back to life and to see sort of political de demonstrations that were totally peaceful and cheerful, I think made people feel really good. That was a key signal for people taking down boarded up storefronts. Same thing, I mean, West Philadelphia 52nd Street got hit really badly by vandalism too. I think getting that sense of comfort back in the city is really important. Yeah, I agree. Paul, what do what did we forget to ask you that you want to talk to us about that you didn't talk about? Well, I'm really interested in here. I mean, I have my impressions from numbers are really just curious. I mean, is the volume of interest in housing still strong? Are you still getting lots of clients? Is there a difference? Yeah, I can I can I can kind of give you the 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 perspective from let's say March, March till now. Okay. So um, you know, end end of March obviously is when the pandemic hit. Uh, the real estate market started to slow down. We were we were coming into a, a great momentum, and we had a ton of momentum going into the spring market, and it was projected to be an unbelievable spring market for us. And then the pandemic hit, and April was was a very very slow month, probably the slowest month uh, as far as new new properties going under contract. That I you know from the data it, from you know at least the 15 years that I could see back from the data. May was also very slow as far as closings go as well. Then the end of May, when when real estate opened back up again and they re, you know they they lifted the stay at home order, that's when things started to, to open back up again and started to get good. Um, July, August, and September. Uh, well, I say June, July, August, and September were some of the best months that we've seen in real estate, at least since I've I've been in real estate, which wow. is 2008. Uh, it was, you know, for a lot of people uh, in, in the industry, it was their best quarter ever. The third quarter was their best quarter ever. A lot of brokerages that I talked to, best quarter ever. And just looking at the statistics from all of Bright MLS, which covers, you know, the whole state and, and, and a lot of other states as well. Um, it was the best quarter as far as new contracts going under, new properties going under contract and closings uh, that have happened in, in the 15 years back that I could look at from the data. Now that was through the end of September. Now there's a little bit of a different story occur, uh, occurring right now um, where inventory levels are, are up very high, uh, double or triple what they were uh, about a year ago, and that's in Philadelphia. 
So that's the leading indicator for us that the absorption rate is not, the properties are not being absorbed and bought as quickly as- well, do you mean, what do you see in terms of the so-called flight from the city? Are those, is that inventory growing because people are looking to get out of the city? I think it's a number of things. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm talking about Philadelphia specifically. The, right. the, suburbs, okay. the suburbs and New Jersey, uh, they are still very, very busy markets right now. Right. Through, through October, through November, they're very, very busy. Philadelphia started to slow down in, in October from, from, from the data that I'm reading and, and even just from my own experience. Okay. Um, I think you are seeing some people move out of the city uh, towards the suburbs I think you are uh, seeing people list their properties on, on the market that maybe weren't listing them before. Um, people are, are a little bit slow to buy because of the pandemic. Uh, maybe the election had something to do with it as well. Um, but we're seeing a lot of people coming in from other cities. We're seeing right. a lot of people coming in from New York and, and, and other places. I have more New York and Chicago and other buyers than, than I can ever remember having. That's uh, a huge potential upside for us. I, I people think wanting so. to leave New York. Yeah, right. I, think, I think we see a lot of the data talking about the flight from Philadelphia, but they always miss the other data point, which is how right. many new people are coming. It's the right. same, same conversation we used to have with you know, there's there's too much rental inventory on the market. And, and, and the thing I always say, well, they forgot to talk about how many new people are coming into the city to absorb this uh, rental. Right. Inventory. They never really talk about that. So I don't, I don't know what the data will show. You know, we're getting into October right now, which is typically the time of the year where things uh, slow down for us anyway. So it's hard to tell whether this is um, just seasonality for us or this is going to be a trend moving forward. Um, or if it had anything to do with the election or any of that stuff. So there's a lot of, we don't have enough data yet to, to give you a real answer, but the trend starting in October and even through November starting to slow down in the city, but still continuing to be busy in the, in the suburbs. And Interesting. Different. Yeah. Yep. Um, I mean, so real quick, um, Alan, Alan Dom uh, has, has a comment. He's on this call. And uh, Alan, you want to unmute yourself? Hi, Alan. How you doing? Hey, yeah, thanks, Noah. Hey, Paul. Great hey, presentation. Alan great presentation right i just thought i would give you my overview of what i'm seeing paul and noah and everyone else we're you know we're i'm clearly seeing the uh the seashore booming florida booming suburbs booming townhouses doing pretty well across the city but the area that's getting affected the most is high-rise multifamily and i can share specific data if you'd like but yeah, people are saying, especially baby boomers who live in the high rises, whether it's around Rittenhouse Square or Washington Square, many of them have multiple homes in Florida or the Jersey Shore, have not been here since March, and are just saying to us, sell the property. We want out. We're not coming back. There's no lifestyle. We're not coming back. We've got to bring that lifestyle back. I know you're talking about it. It's getting there, and we have those sidewalk uh, bills and the streeteries, which is great, so that's helping it, but we got to get that lifestyle back. And then on the rental front, what we're seeing, I know you said 70% of the college students claim they're at school. Right. They're not, they're not renting apartments. We, rent collections are strong residentially, but filling vacant rental units in the high rises is a nightmare. There's no demand right now. And I was just on with David Edelman saying good things about his stuff in West Philadelphia, though. That's interesting. Maybe I don't want to be downtown. Maybe I don't want to be out there. I'm just going to tell you that right. you can go to the Dorchester right now. Right. There's 31 vacant apartments. Right. Okay? And if you drop the rent in half, you still would not rent them. Right. There's no demand. We need those. We need those office buildings back, Paul. Right. That's really what we need. We need to figure out how to get these offices right. uh, open. So that's just a quick right. overview. Thanks. I, Thank it's you. Great. No, I saw a question pop up, which I'll answer the pedestrian counting cameras. These are digital cameras that don't take pictures, but actually track the movement of people. And so, and they can tell the difference between a dog and a person. I can't tell you how, but they do. And so they're out there counting, but not taking a visual image. So there are 20 locations downtown. I saw that pop up on the screen. So I'm going to answer that one. Nice. Um, yeah, the, Alan's comment about the rental market is an interesting one as well. I, I know I only focused on sales um, and Alan was really ma mainly talking about the high rises uh, and how there's a slowdown there. But I, I'm, I'm actually seeing a slowdown in the rental market, not just in the high rises, but but all over all over 
the city, small buildings, big buildings and everything like that. And, and like Alan said, it's not, you can drop the rent in half and you still won't rent it. And, and, and I think he's probably right about that because there's just not a lot of inventory. I mean, not a lot of, uh, new people wanting to rent properties. I mean, we, we saw just from, you know, we have a lot of rental properties, you know, that we, that we manage and we saw going from the summer to now where we were getting, you know, thousands and thousands of, of leads, rental leads every single month that has dropped off significantly. Meaning there's not as many people inquiring about the rental properties that we, that we have, no matter what the price is. So that's, that's going to be an interesting trend to, to look at moving forward as well. Yeah, I would separate in terms of what Alan said. When I showed you that, I didn't elaborate. When I showed you the different response around safety from people 55 and older versus 34 and under, I think our biggest flight risks right now are the empty nesters who moved in from the suburbs, who moved in to be near arts and culture, who are less willing to go inside of restaurants, who were really shocked by the vandalism and looting, and who are concerned about empty streets. That's where I think the biggest worry is there. I think, you know, people under 35 are more, let's call it risk oblivious, more tolerant of, of sort of discordant things there. I don't mean to minimize the problem, but that's where I think our biggest challenge is. And I, I assume that a lot of the rental in the high-end market is people moving to the city for work. And obviously that's probably not happening at this point. So I think tying back to what Alan said is the sooner we get office workers back, the sooner we'll have that vitality, I think in that market as well. Yeah. But Office workers, schools, right. all of that. Yeah, stuff. and obviously we just went the other way on schools yesterday and today, so. Yeah, I, I read something interesting this morning, not to get off subject, but um, there's a proposal potentially moving forward in the next couple months where there's going to be a, a moratorium on rents and mortgages. Did you, did you read about that? Uh, you, national or locally in Philadelphia? National. This would be a yeah. national thing that would come forward. It'd be a moratorium on rents and mortgages for a period of time, which would be funded by the government to, to, fun, to pay the mortgages for people and pay the rents for people to help, you know, cover uh, whatever those costs are going to be. That, that could be something interesting. I mean, I think we just have to get through the end of this election and a new Congress and, you know, a new president of Washington. And that's nothing's going to move until that's sort of sorted out. Yep. Ian, is that your daughter or your son? I was going to ask what their opinion was. They seem to be very involved in the call there for a second. Uh, my daughter. Yeah. Daughter. Okay. Yeah. Alan, Alan, you had another comment? Yeah, I just wanted to say to all of you, Paul Levy and the Center City District are amazing. Okay. Oh, thank you. I'm in government. I see what they do. Thank God for the Center City District. You, None of us would have the livelihoods without the Center City District. And I remember what it was like prior to the Center City District back in the 80s. It was a nightmare. So, Paul, thank you to you and well, your thanks. team. That's We're generous, Alan. Alan. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions here. But I, you know, on behalf of everybody, again, I wanted to thank you so much. Awesome presentation and great to hear your perspective on so many of the different questions that people had today. And it's always good to have you on these. And you're, you're right in the thick of things, telling us what's going on uh, in the city, the stuff that we don't even really think, you know, have to think about, thanks to you. And uh, we just really appreciate everything you do and look forward to having you back next year with some more positive news. Well, hopefully it'll be much more positive next year. But Noah, <laughs> thanks very much for inviting me. And thank you all for the work you're doing. Look forward to talking to you again in person sometime soon. Absolutely. Take care now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.